to summarize this basically, God's desire is to give himself to us. And this is how uh, this is how it happens. The crucifixion and resurrection. And we have this a lot of us have this misconception in especially in the Western world. Um, I don't know all the history of how this idea came about, but I know that there is little seeds of this idea, at least there wasn't me growing up, um, that the crucifixion is about Jesus paying a debt to the wrathful, to a wrathful father. He, that um, he had to die for us um, to appease the father. And this is a heresy, this is not true. <laughs> Jesus is actually paying our debt to death. And uh, if we listen carefully, I love, uh, one of the things I love about Lent is the liturgy of St. Basil, because that anaphora, anaphora of St. Basil, that is just this powerhouse of theology. If you just listen to those um, prayers of the anaphora, um, if you're not familiar with what the anaphora is, You'll notice during Lent on Sundays, the liturgy is a little bit longer. The prayers surrounding uh, the consecration of the Eucharist um, are longer, they're, they're richer, they tell us the whole history of salvation. And uh, just to listen to that, we can understand our theology better. So one of the lines explains what I just said. Jesus surrendered himself as a ransom to death by which we were held captive, sold into slavery under sin. So when we look at the icon of the crucifixion, we should actually see the Father pouring out his love for us through the Son. This is not about him being angry with us and paying a debt. This is the Father pouring himself out, giving himself to us through the Son. God wants to give himself to us. This is his purpose for us. So I just want to pause for a moment just before we go on, just for you to think about or to ask God to show you, is this how you perceive of God? That this is his total purpose for you, is to give himself to you, to love you. If we're being honest, we probably all have at least some bit of a belief within us, or at least I do, that our relationship with God is one of owing something to God, that we have to do the right things to please Him, to try to be good people. And this is the idea that needs corrected, that needs healed so that we can experience prayer as it's made to be. And this is a lifelong process that won't be completed until heaven. There will always be uh, weakness in us, always be sin in us, always be things within us that need corrected and healed and purified. And that's okay. This process of purification and healing, this process is our relationship with God. We don't need to perfect ourselves first before we go to God, before we go to prayer. Prayer is about being there so that God can give himself to us. Heaven is where prayer will be fulfilled and complete because heaven is union with God. But what is prayer? Prayer, like heaven, is also union with God. So prayer is where heaven begins on earth. This is how the kingdom of God is already present here with us through prayer. So this is why it's so important to have a correct idea about what prayer is. Um, at, 
to have the correct idea about um, about God, who He is, what His purpose is for us. Because otherwise, we're going to spend our time and effort doing what we think prayer is, but really isn't, and really isn't the beginning of heaven. Because heaven isn't about earning God's love or doing the right things to be good. This is a beautiful quote from the Catechism. It starts by quoting John 4, the story of Jesus meeting the Samaritan woman at the well. If you knew the gift of God, the wonder of prayer is revealed beside the well where we come seeking water. There, Christ comes to meet every human being. It is he who first seeks us and asks us for a drink. Jesus thirsts. His asking arises from the depths of God's desire for us. Whether we realize it or not, prayer is the encounter of God's thirst with ours. God thirsts that we may thirst for him. The Catechism also says, Prayer is the response of faith to the free promise of salvation and also a response of love to the thirst of the only Son of God. I recommend reading the whole section of the Catechism on prayer. It's so beautiful. This is just a little taste. And it was actually written by a Byzantine Catholic priest. So we've been talking about union with God. So what is that? Well, union is communion. It's most simply stated a relationship. But it's not just any relationship. It's a deep and life-giving relationship. And on earth, marriage is the closest analogy that we have to explain what this relationship with God is all about. And marriage is actually the analogy, analogy that is used throughout scripture, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, to explain this relationship with God. Here are just a couple of examples. From Isaiah 54, Fear not, for your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And from Isaiah 62, As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. This is uh, one of the, re the reasons why my monastery is called Christ the Bridegroom Monastery, because we recognize that this analogy of um, Christ being the bridegroom of the church as the bride, and how much that teaches us about uh, just this basic relationship with God, the basic purpose of uh, God for us, and going back to that uh, basic thing so that we can build everything upon that. <clears throat> the last couple of years, I've been uh, trying to read more of the Old Testament because I will have to admit I haven't yet read the whole Bible. <laughs> Uh, so, and I figured, well, yeah, and I'm probably, uh, every Christian should probably read the whole Bible, let alone none. So, I said, well, I can do this one chapter a day at a time. It'll take you a while, but, um, and rereading things I'd already read. Um, but reading, especially the prophets in the Old Testament, oh my gosh, I just, um, I didn't know what that was all about. I think I had heard bits and pieces of things, and um, from growing up just not being very familiar with the Old Testament, and I kind of had this idea that like in the Old Testament was like this wrathful God who just did all these terrible things, and I don't know, somehow he must have changed, and <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know what that's all about. Um, but if we actually read large portions of the Old Testament, especially the books of the prophets, like the whole book, don't just pick one chapter because a lot of the chapters are pretty dark. <laughs> but if you, you read, the, you have to read the whole thing. You have to start from the beginning and get to the end. And you realize that all of God's punishments to his people, Israel, it's not because he's angry and so out of wrath and to just get rid of them, he punishes them. He punishes them because 
he loves them so much. He loves us so much that he knows that their separation from him is a much greater anguish than his punishments. And his punishments are to wake them up and to say, hello, I'm here. You doing your own thing off, off over here is just going to lead you to ruin. I, I want to be with you. I want to give myself to you. I want to send my Savior um, through you. You are my chosen people. And now we as the church are the new Israel. We are his chosen people. He wants to give Jesus to the world through us. And uh, just throughout um, scripture, if, if we don't just spot read, if we actually persevere and read through it, we see how patient God is to just keep trying to bring us back to him because of his great, great love for us. There's another passage from Isaiah, chapter 43. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. If we take time to read and listen to Scripture with these eyes, with the knowledge that God wants to give himself to us, then prayer will come more, much more naturally because we'll understand the disposition we need to have when we come to prayer. This is another uh, sort of image that I, I had for a long time about prayer. I think that I used to think that prayer was a gas station where you go to get re refueled to then be able to go back and do the work that God wants you to do. So you, you're out there doing his work and you get exhausted and you're just like, there's nothing left. And then you go to the gas station, you go pray so you can get refilled, so you can do more of his work. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> well, that's actually not what prayer is. <laughs> and that's something that I've been slowly learning. <laughs> The Catechism says that the life of prayer is the habit of being in the presence of the thrice holy God and being in communion with him. Prayer is not a gas station where we go to get refueled. Prayer, prayer is the thing. Prayer is the most important thing. It is our relationship with God. Um, it's what we're made for. It's, prayer is life. It's everything. It's everything that God wants to be for us and for us to be for God. It's uh, something to, to encompass and engulf our whole life. And we can't earn this union with God. Our job is to receive it. And um, Prayer is a gift, and it's actually mostly God's work, which is something that is difficult for me to accept, <laughs> because I think that this is something I need to do. I need to take time, I need to pick a place, I need to make this happen, I need to do the right things. Um, but prayer is actually mostly God's work. But there is... Um, there is something that we need to do, but I think most of us have the wrong idea about what the something is. Our effort should be mainly towards receiving and disposing ourselves to receive. And we might argue, well, aren't I supposed to like, give myself back? Isn't this about me loving? Yes, but when we put our effort towards receiving God's love and doing the things we can to dispose ourselves to receive his love, then the gift of ourselves will just flow out of us naturally, uh, like water overflowing out of a bucket. In the summer, remember as kids we used to like to play with the hose and you know, 
squirt each other, squirt our parents. <laughs> um, and I kind of had this image of just like filling up a bucket with water. And you know, when you keep, when it's already when it's all the way up to the top, and you keep pouring more in, that the water in the like the bucket's not saying like, oh, let me give the grass some water on the sides. It's it's receiving the water from the hose, and that water is naturally pouring out around it. So our our love will naturally pour back to God and pour out onto those around us. Um, and actually, when we allow this to happen, that love that's pouring out of us will be God's love instead of our love, which is infinitely more powerful, more more life-changing than our love. So this is true um, of all prayer. But at this point is where I want to bring in contemplative prayer, which is uh, where I wanted to focus my talk. And when you think of contemplative prayer, you probably think of monks and nuns in monasteries being silent all day. And <laughs> Um, and that's why I titled this talk, Who Me? Contemplative Prayer, because I knew I was going to be talking to lay people uh, who don't live in a monastery, who have a busy, sometimes noisy life. And the good news I have for you is that contemplative prayer is the simplest expression of the mystery of prayer. It is a gift of grace. It can be accepted only in humility and poverty. So I think what's the good news about that is the simplest expression of the mystery of prayer. You don't need to be, I don't know, I guess people think of monks and nuns as these professional Christians who are really holy, but I can tell you that's just, <laughs> we're very human. <laughs> And um, we have all the same struggles. And maybe it is, it is good to, to think of monks and nuns when we think of contemplative prayer, because monastics are called to be the simplest Christians, because simple means uh, only one thing, like purity, simplicity. You're focused on one thing, which is God. So monastics, um, we give up many things and live a simple life that's focused more on God, that less distractions, less other things, so that we can really focus on this most important relationship. So it's not that contemplative prayer requires all these special, um, special skill and special ways of doing it and special secrets that only monastics know. <laughs> it's actually the simplest, easiest type of prayer. So that's, that's the good news, because it's a gift from God. Contemplative prayer is the prayer of being with God, of receiving him, like we've been talking about. And the reason why we all have the ability for contemplative prayer is because we've all been chrismated, all received baptism and chrismation. We've received the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit does within us, it's kind of like a pilot light. So once we receive the sacrament of chrismation, we receive the Holy Spirit. and. The Holy Spirit comes and is with, the, with us. Our pilot light is lit, and that thing is not going out. <laughs> it's there, no matter if we do nothing about it, if we're not aware of it or anything, that pilot light is there. This is when my pilot light got lit. This is my baptism and chrismation by Father Barkas. And so, we have this pilot light, and contemplative prayer is, we can think of it as the stirring up of this flame within us, or giving it more fuel. 
I didn't grow up with a gas stove, but when I came to the monastery, I started to use it, and it's pretty fun. I like fire a lot. <laughs> so, um, contemplative prayer is like when we, that pilot light's always on, but we've got to turn the knob to give it some fuel so it actually can go poof and do something. <laughs> And once that, that flame is going, we carry that flame with us wherever we go and whatever we do. So even when we can't really, we have to do other things. We can't just sit and pray all day. But that flame is burning within us, even though we're not aware of it. And we take that with us. We take the spirit of prayer with us. So contemplative prayer is the work of the Holy Spirit. And this type of prayer this being with God, this receiving his love, <coughs> is the flame that animates the other types of prayer. So when we so meditating on scripture is another type of prayer that's different from contemplative prayer. But when we have this flame within us, when we have contemplative prayer as this foundation, when we go to meditate on scripture, when we think about it, reflect on it, and talk to God about it. We're not limiting ourselves only to thinking, because that's how meditation can become. It can become just me thinking, well, what do I think this means, or how does this make me feel? Um, but there's actually this connection with God through this flame as we're doing that. And then when we participate in the divine liturgy, or in other liturgical prayer, or in family prayer at home, um, when we have this flame within us, this contemplative prayer life, then when we're praying these liturgical prayers, when we're saying the words of prayers, we're not just saying words and making empty actions. Because you can come to the Divine Liturgy and you can, you can sing the whole time, and you can say all those words, you can make the sign of the cross every time that you're supposed to, and you could not be praying at all. We need this, we need this flame to animate us. We need this relationship with God, this being with him, this receiving him, this being in his presence, in order to make all of those other types of prayers life-giving and full of life. We need those other types of prayer. But without contemplative prayer, those other types of prayer will be hollow, shallow, they won't penetrate us, they won't move us, they won't affect us, they won't sustain us, and they won't help bring the world into union with God. The Catechism explains that contemplative prayer is the prayer of the child of God, of the forgiven sinner, who agrees to welcome the love by which he is loved, and who wants to respond to it by loving even more. But he knows that the love he is returning is poured out by the Spirit in his heart, for everything is grace from God. Contemplative prayer is the poor and humble surrender to the loving will of the Father, in ever deeper union with his beloved Son. So that's a very beautiful summary. So how do we stir up the flame of contemplative prayer? What is the fuel that we give to this flame? Well, the first thing is time. We need to set, to set aside some time for this type of prayer. And I'm not going to tell you uh, what time of day or how much time. That's for you to discern individually with God's help. Uh, one thing I will say is that five or ten minutes a day is better than nothing. But that's probably the time we give to someone that we don't really care about that much. <laughs> Um, and so maybe that's a good place to start, and maybe it would be good to work up to a little bit longer. What uh, talk to God about that? You know, continue praying and uh, discerning. You know, what time of day is good? How much time? Um, depending on your vocation, your state in life, what is possible for you? Um, sometimes it might be that maybe you really do only have five minutes, but God, God can work in that five minutes, 
and make it more fruitful than if you had an hour. So it's not something to beat yourself up about, but it's something to take seriously and uh, to push yourself a little bit with that. But it's good to start with smaller amount at the beginning and slowly increase that. Because if, you, if you're like, all right, I'm gonna go home and pray an hour a day, um, and then it's really hard and you give up altogether. And that's what the devil wants. So sometimes the devil actually encourage us, encourages us um, to do too much, which seems weird because why would the devil want us to pray more? But it's because he wants us to give up and to quit. So it's, it's always a balancing act. Um, but God will help us. He will guide us. Another um, bit of fuel that we need to give is a place for prayer. And I'll give you a little peek into my monastic cell. This is my icon corner. We have this beautiful tradition in the Byzantine church of um, icon corners. And uh, sometimes these are places where the whole family will gather for prayer, or an individual members of the family can also pray there too, or in your bedroom, or wherever. So if it's possible, it's really good to make a place for prayer and to have icons there that really speak to you. Don't just um, don't just pick any icon. Pick pick one where you can look into the face of Christ and you can see His gentleness and His strength gazing back at you with love. If it's not possible for you to make an icon corner, that's okay too. Maybe you have a church nearby or just a quiet place to be. And then when you're there, this might seem very basic, but um, it's a lot more important than you think to make the sign of the cross as we start. Because this is not just emotion. This is not just, oh, well, I'm Byzantine, so I make the sign of the cross with three fingers and go to the right, and isn't that cool? This is actually a sign of entering into the Trinity. The sign of the cross is a reminder to you of what God's purpose is for you, to give himself to you, to bring you into the Trinity. It's a sign to you of what prayer is all about. So even if you forget everything else from this talk, when you make the sign of the cross, when you start to pray, let let that be a reminder to you of what God wants for you and what this is all about. And then, before you start, ask the Holy Spirit for help. The Holy Spirit is the flame within you. He's the one doing this prayer. You need his help. You need to remember that you need his help. Ask him to pray in you. You can pray the Heavenly King prayer that we used when we started today, or you can just pray in your own words. And then be aware of His loving, of God's loving gaze upon you. It's really important to do this when we start, because right from the beginning, we're going to be tempted to think this is all about us, and I have to do the right things, and oh, am I doing this right, am I doing this wrong, I don't know. And if we start out by Imagining God gazing upon us, because that's what's happening all the time. We're just not aware of it all the time. Let ourselves be aware of his greatness and his goodness and his gaze of love. Just for you, just as you are right now. This is my favorite icon of Christ. It's called the Pantocrator from Mount Sinai. And I know that some people find this image to be stern, but I don't. I see in it um, Christ's strength and his power and also his gentleness and tenderness for me. So find an icon that speaks these things to you. Take consolation in his power and his strength and his gaze of love. And then we need some silence and we need both exterior silence and interior silence. So I think the exterior is probably self-explanatory. Uh, 
And that's not only just noises, it can just be distractions. So if just having your phone with you, even if it's not making any noise, but you know it's there and you're tempted to go do something or you're wondering if someone's going to text you or whatever, then put it in the other room or turn it off. Anything that um, is going to pull you out of this time of being with God. The harder part, the much harder part, is the interior silence. And when we have so much exterior silence around us, we're not even aware of our interior noise. And that's the more difficult thing. And that's what we in the monastery especially come up against, is our interior silence. And uh, this, there are things that we can do to, to help this interior silence. It's ultimately a gift from God. But um, something that helps is to work on just being in the present moment. And this is really hard. <laughs> the thing is, we just get so easily distracted, not even about bad things, about good things, too. Um, and we can get so frustrated and be tempted just to give up. But the beautiful thing about this is that every distraction that pulls us away from being with God is an opportunity to come back to Him and to show our love for Him and our dedication for Him. He rejoices every time we let go of that distraction. We bring our attention back to Him and to being still and resting with Him and thinking about Him and waiting for Him. So if you have to draw your attention, if you get distracted a hundred times, that means you can show God your love for him and let him love you and be merciful to you a hundred times while you're praying. And then an optional little bit of food, a little bit of fuel, could be um, a little bit of scripture or a spiritual book. That's okay to do. But we don't want to spend the whole time reading because... We need some contemplative prayer, and uh, if we're just reading the whole time, it turns more into meditation or just thinking. And so a little bit of scripture or a, maybe a paragraph from a spiritual book is a good way to get us started. It's a little bit of a fuel to give to that flame to get it stored up, stirred up, especially when we just feel very dry and we just... We don't really have anything. We don't know what to talk to God about, or we don't know what to bring to Him. This can help um, stir things up. It can um, help give some content for our prayer. So what you can do is, um, when you read something, you can uh, talk to God about that. Or just let it draw you into the mystery of God, and then rest and be still with Him. Another um, bit of fuel, or actually I see this more as air for the fire, because a fire can't burn without air, which is thanksgiving. Being thankful to God for all the gifts he's given us. I often ask the Holy Spirit to, um, to thank the Father in me, or to show me what to thank the Father for, because a lot of times I'm not even aware of the blessings and the grace that I receive throughout the day. And when I pray that, all of a sudden things will just come into mind, I'm like, wow, yeah, that's, that was amazing. I didn't even think about that and how that was a gift from God. And this Thanksgiving really helps to direct us towards God. So when we're having trouble, um, turning towards him and remaining in his presence, or things just feel stale, we feel stuck. Um, Thanksgiving is just this um, flowing in of air for the fire. Another important thing is to speak honestly to God. And if you find that you're talk just talking to yourself, which I spend so much of my prayer time just doing this, <laughs> Uh, I think that I'm praying, and then 15 minutes later, I'm like, wow, I was just talking to myself the whole time. <laughs> but it's not, the, it's not the worst thing, because then all we have to do is, oh, Lord, I wasn't talking to you, I was talking to myself. 
And then I just kind of summarized to him what I was just saying to myself, but I directed to him. I just sort of changed the words instead of like, oh, I wonder what I'm going to do about that situation that I have to deal with today. Oh, yeah. Father, what do you want me to do about that situation? And usually, as soon as I redirect towards him, it's it's usually not that he speaks something and I immediately know, oh yeah, that's exactly what I need to do. But he usually fills me with peace. Or maybe he'll eventually direct me to a scripture that helps me with that. Or I'm just more aware of him throughout the day. And so when that situation comes up that I was worried about, I'll be more aware of his presence and I'll, I'll get myself out of the way so that he can actually do something. So let the difficult and the joyful situations of your life be the content of your prayer. God loves you, not you apart from your struggles and joys. You don't need to set aside all those things that are part of you in your life and set them outside your room and then go into pray and you think, oh, I'm, all I'm going to do is, is think about God. <laughs> But no, he like bring all of that with you and lay it before him, speak to him about it, and then let it go and give it to him. And then the next thing, so I was kind of talking about, you know, some scripture, Thanksgiving, speaking honestly to God. This is the way that we start things out. But then don't forget to listen, because remember, God wants to give himself to us. We need to, and I was talking about that interior noise. We need to bring ourselves honestly as we are before him with our joys and our struggles. But we also, I was saying before, that contemplative prayer is about being with God and receiving him. We need to do that. We need to listen. We need to be still. And so the last... Um, bit of fuel that I want to talk to you about, which is very important, is waiting. God increases your longing, our longing for him by seeming to be absent. And we actually seek him more when we think he's gone. That's why people who reach a deep low in their life, maybe every, like everything's just utterly falling apart. And sometimes that's the first time that they pray. And that's, like I was talking about before with the Old Testament, that's why God allowed everything to fall apart for the Israelites, because he wanted to draw them to himself. And so he, he often allows that to happen in our lives. Um, but sometimes it's not necessarily everything falls apart and we're at the, the lowest lows we've ever been in. But sometimes we just don't really feel him very present. Um, and he, he does that because he wants us to seek him more and not to forget about him. He wants to increase, increase our longing for him. And this longing is important. Pope Benedict wrote, The fathers of the church say that prayer properly understood is nothing other than becoming a longing for God. In Mary, this petition has been granted. She is, as it were, the open vessel of longing in which life becomes prayer and prayer becomes life. And here's a beautiful icon that helps to illustrate this. This is called the Plati Terra, which means more spacious than the heavens. And the reason it's called that is because this is a depiction of Jesus within the womb of Mary. And more spacious than the heavens because Jesus is God, who is infinite, and he came to dwell within a finite being. So the infinite is within the finite, and Mary, and therefore she's more spacious than the heavens. And for me, this is an image of this longing, this desire that um, 
God wants us to have for him because um, we, he wants us to be able to receive more and more of him. And he's infinite and he has to make more space in us. He has to make this space inside of us bigger. So uh, a little analogy I thought of for this would be um, imagine that uh, some famous designer of furniture calls you up the one day and says, I want to give you the best and most beautiful piece of furniture that I have ever designed. Uh, OK, thanks. <laughs> and they're, they'll say, I'll, I'll be there tomorrow at 10 to deliver it. All right, well, I guess I better make some room. And you have this tiny little house. And so uh, you kind of like move some things and like make space for a little end table and you hope that like that's the right size because they didn't tell you what it was going to be. And they come and they deliver this 10-foot marvelous dining room set. Like, I don't have any room in this house that could possibly fit that. Even if I got rid of all my other furniture, I can't fit a 10-foot. 10 foot dining room table. We have one at the monastery, but it fits. <laughs> um, and so, well, you're going to have to do some renovations. <laughs> you're going to have to make your house bigger. And so that's what God is doing interiorly inside of us. Another uh, analogy, which will only make sense for those who have read Harry Potter, <laughs> but this is, I think about this all the time. So. Um, in Harry Potter, there's, I guess, there's some sort of charm or whatever where they can make like the inside of something like way bigger than it looks from the outside. So, it, like for example, when they go to a Quidditch match and they, which is the sporting event they have, and they set up their tents, um, you go inside one of the tents, it just looks like a little camping tent, but inside it's like this huge mansion. <laughs> and um, that's what I always think of when. Uh, I read the scripture where Jesus says, in my father's house there are many mansions. And it's often translated, in my father's house there are many rooms. But really, at least from what I'm told, the Greek is, the better translation is actually, in my father's house there are many mansions. Which doesn't really make sense to our mind, but it's just showing like, when we enter within, God just makes everything, like he's infinite, he just makes everything huge. And as we grow in prayer, we find that um, giving our lives more and more to God doesn't make things more stifling for us. It actually makes things just like huge and expansive and free. And a beautiful story that I heard about this um, was uh, someone who went to visit the monastery where St. Therese had lived in France. And before he went there, he had read her story of soul, and um, he imagined her monastery to be this humongous place with these huge gardens, like vast gardens and fields and everything. And he went there and realized, oh my gosh, it's really small. <laughs> but it was because the way she described it, like her heart was so expansive because of God dwelling within her that she experienced her monastery, she experienced the world as this huge place. So this is why waiting for God and being with him is so important because that waiting, that time just in silence, just being with him is stretching and stretching and stretching our heart so that it can become this huge mansion where God dwells. So there's a question that I wanted to address, and it's not a very good question, but it's a question that I ask all the time, and I'm assuming from some of your head nods that you probably ask this too, or you will ask it as you start to pray, or as you start to pray more. How do we know if we're doing it right? Well, It would be better if we didn't ask this question at all, but since we do, we'll talk about it. <laughs> the first thing, the most important thing, is not to evaluate your prayer while you're doing it. Don't do that. So I have a friend of mine. Um, he was sharing this story that he was having 
uh, a really great time with his friends. You know, one of those moments where it's like, wow, this is like this is this is one of the good moments of life. Just laughing and just there's no time. You, you're not aware of anything else. You're just with these people and just totally enjoying life. And I'm sure you can think of one of those moments. And so he was in the midst of this moment. It was so beautiful. And all of a sudden, he just kind of sat back and looked at his friends, and he said, isn't this great? And they just go, you just ruined it. <laughs> you just ruined the moment. By, you just stepped out of the moment, and you ruined it. <laughs> and so for me, that's, that's what I mean when don't evaluate your prayer while you're doing it, because then you're not praying anymore. You're, you've stepped outside. So, but outside of our time of prayer, we can take a moment to look at it, to ask, and asking God to see it with his own eyes. And can, we can ask, are we looking at God or only ourselves? Are we asking for his help? Are we peacefully giving him ourselves in love? We can't evaluate it very well though because our prayer is happening in secret within us. But God knows, and if we desire to pray, He is leading us, and He won't lead us astray. So we don't need to keep asking ourselves, am I doing this wrong? <laughs> because He will lead us and He will teach us if we're genuinely trying to do it. Another little warning is that sometimes we have feelings and sometimes not. Feel, I mean feelings in regards to like while we're praying we might feel something in particular. But we can't totally trust our feelings. They're part of us and they're good content for starting a dialogue with God. But we can't judge our prayer based on them. Just because we have good feelings doesn't mean, or just because we don't have good feelings doesn't mean our prayer is bad. And as we grow in prayer, we will come to desire God more than we desire to have good feelings. So don't reject your feelings because they're part of who you are and we don't want to put aside anything of who we are when we come before God, but hold them in open hands before God allowing him to do whatever he wants to do with those feelings. The only way we can really evaluate our prayer is by the fruits of our prayer. So if we're growing, especially in love of God and love of others, these are good fruits. And the fruits come slowly over time. We can't expect um, this overabundant charity for us right away. But one thing not to get confused about as we're looking at the fruits is that as we grow in our relationship with God, we actually start to see our weaknesses more than we did before. This is something that in a monastery becomes very, very clear. And seeing our weaknesses is actually a great gift that God is giving us. As we pray, and we go deeper and deeper into ourselves, he opens up these new caverns of black yuckiness inside of us. And that doesn't mean that we're doing it wrong or that he's displeased with us. This is a gift. It means that prayer is working. And he opens up these places so that we can invite him in deeper and deeper. We see that like, oh wow, that I didn't even know that was in me. That's pretty yucky. And we can say, Lord, come in here too. Come in deeper. Help me not to be afraid to invite you in deeper. And don't be discouraged. Another fruit that I think is important, because a lot of times when we think about prayer, we think about intercessory prayer and asking um, things for ourselves and things for others. And as we grow in contemplative prayer, our intercessory prayer changes. 
it becomes more confident and trusting. And instead of going to God only when we need something for ourselves or for others, as we spend time in contemplative prayer, our heart actually starts to ache for the world. And we simply hold out all of this suffering before God. We realize that no matter how much I pray, I can't change this. This is way bigger than I can do anything about. I can't even change myself. And we just, even when we're not thinking about praying for someone, sometimes this, this ache, this desire to pray for the world will just come out of us. And we'll just hold all of the pain of the world out to him. And we won't spend a whole lot, we won't spend all of our time um, interceding for the world, interceding for those we love or asking for things, because we'll know that just being with him and receiving his love is going to overflow from us like the water out of that bucket. And we know that just bringing those we love to him bringing our needs to him is enough. Just like at the wedding at Cana, when Mary said to Jesus, they're out of wine. That's all she said. She said, Jesus, please, I know you haven't performed any miracles yet, and I know that um, and this wedding is going to be ruined if you don't do something, and please, 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 don't be that nagging woman. <laughs> that... You're not going to break down God. <laughs> just, just be merry. Just come and say, Lord, they're out of line. And then let him take care of it. So I just want to do one last thing. Um, so my brother Mark is coming around to hand out these handouts, except actually I need one. <laughs> So since we're talking about prayer, I figured that it would be good for us to take just a few minutes to pray. And um, my mom suggested that I share this poem with you, which is on the back side of this handout. The front side, I listed a few um, books on prayer that I really recommend. They're excellent, excellent books for um, some more fuel for your prayer. And then I listed uh, some of the quotes from my talk if you want to go back to those. But then I'll turn to the back side. And this is a prayer uh, that I wrote on my parents' 35th anniversary and I dedicated to them called A Soul That Prays. And I thought what I would do is I'll read the poem, and as I'm reading it, just keep in mind whichever stanza sticks out the most to you, whatever is in there that strikes you the most. When I'm finished, we'll just take a few minutes to just go back uh, to that stanza and to pray with that a little bit. And I'll explain that more once I finish. A soul that prays is a still mountain that has glimpsed its creator. A soul that prays is a heron knee deep, silent, waiting. A soul that prays is an empty chalice held up to the fountain of life. 
A soul that prays is an inhabited room expanding with longing. A soul that prays is a broken vessel unashamed. A soul that prays is a piece of iron remaining in the furnace of love. A soul that prays is an invisible flame on the lampstand of sacrifice. A soul that prays is a gentle whisper, inhaling and exhaling with the breath of the Spirit. A soul that prays is a divine liturgy offered by the hands of the sun. A soul that prays is a son of the Father, returning to his ravishing gaze. A soul that prays is another forerunner, shouting salvation into Hades. A soul that prays is a lover overtaken by beauty, lost. A soul that prays is a blind child in a starless night, dancing and singing the praise of your glory. So don't take too much time to figure out which one you want to pray with. Just pick one. And we'll just take a moment um, to uh, just let, it, let that image of what prayer is soak into your bones. Let God speak to you about it or speak to him about it. So this is a way that you can pray with scripture or other spiritual reading to kind of get your prayer started. And I just, I have a few uh, closing things, but right before that, I just want to end with this quote by St. John Vianney, this really beautiful summary of what we've talked about today. I don't... Um, have it up on the screen. Uh, so just try to listen. Prayer is nothing other than union with God. When your heart is pure and united with God, you feel within yourself a balm, a sweetness that is inebriating, a light that is dazzling. In this intimate union, God and the soul are like two pieces of wax that have melted together. You can no longer separate them. It is a very beautiful thing, this union of God with his little creature. It is an incomprehensible blessing. We have not deserved to pray, but God in his goodness has allowed us to speak to him. Our prayer is like incense that he receives with the utmost pleasure. My children, you have a little heart but prayer enlarges it and makes it capable of loving God. Prayer is a foretaste of heaven, a stream flowing from paradise. It never leaves us without sweetness. It is a kind of honey that sinks into the soul and sweetens everything. Troubles melt away in the presence of a prayer that is made well, like snow before the sun. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of this time together. Thank you for the ways that you've opened our hearts and spoken to our hearts. Thank you for the gift of prayer, for this opportunity, this gift you've given us in prayer to be one with you, to receive you, to let you pour out of us. Thank you for giving us your divine life. Help us to open ourselves more deeply to this life that you are pouring into us and to let go more and more of ourselves and to our worry about ourselves and what we're doing and how we're praying. Help us to just be with you and let you do everything in us. Cast out all of our fears, all of our worries. 
cast out all condemnation of the devil when we sit down to pray. Help us to overcome this. Help us to trust in you. Bless all of us who are gathered here and bless our trip home. Mary, the mother of God, I ask you to, and to wrap all of us in your mantle, to help us to pray, to help us to not be discouraged, to help us to let God make us to into a plati terra, more spacious than the heavens. Encourage us and hold us and lead us to your Son. Lead us into the very heart of the Trinity. Amen. In the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.